the timbre resynth brings together the qualities of two different sound sources. It is able to resynthesize the main input using the timbre of a monophonic secondary input. By monophonic, I mean that the timbre resynth ideally expects the secondary sound source to play only one clear pitch at a time. Things like chords or reverbs or delays may inhibit the device's ability to properly extract the timbre. That said, this is a soft requirement, as the timbre resynth has been found to work on material which does not necessarily conform to this expectation. In such cases, it may not behave as you envision, so I would consider the musical context the device is being used in and experiment accordingly. Load the timbre resynth on the channel of the sound you'd like to transform. We'll be processing my song, Reasons Not To. Here, we have a wavetable oscillator. I'd like to resynthesize my song using the timbre of this wavetable. To do so, I'll open the timbre resynth, and under Extract Timbre, I'll select the wavetable's channel. This routes the wavetable into our secondary timbre input. Optionally, I'll mute the wavetable's channel so we don't hear it on top of the resynthesis. We can hear all the changes in timbre happening in the wavetable reflected in our resynthesis. When the wavetable is a square wave, our output sounds like it's composed of square waves. When the wavetable is a sine wave, our output sounds like it's composed of sine waves. There are many ways to use the timbre resynth, and this setup here is only one. Let's take a look at the front panel. The timbre dial affects how the timbre of our secondary input is distributed across the resynthesis. At 0%, the timbre is static. At 100%, the timbre changes with the pitches of the resynthesis. Higher values typically work best with synthetic sounds, while lower values do a better job representing the timbre of acoustic instruments and vocals. This dial allows us to shift the formants of the resynthesis. We can create artificial pitch bends using the glide dial. And transpose the pitch of the whole resynthesis. These four sliders on the right affect various output levels. With the reinforce slider, we can mix in a sub-oscillator to beef up the fundamental frequencies in our resynthesis. The width slider controls the stereo width of the output. The wet gain lets us increase or decrease the volume of only the resynthesized signal, and the mix slider lets us blend between the dry main input and our resynthesis. Next, we'll cover the three submenus on the right side of the device. First is the polytuner. This quantizes the analyzed frequencies to a set of pitches, like a scale. The slider affects the amount of tuning applied. By default, you can tune using a preset scale. Set the tonic of this scale using this knob. Switching to shift, we have independent control over the selected scale's mode and tonic with shift in and shift out, respectively. Alternatively, you can define a custom scale with this keyboard interface, or tune using an external MIDI input. Our second submenu contains the LFO. Here, we can synchronize the resynthesis to our session's tempo. Click this toggle to enable the LFO. Or freeze the resynthesis entirely. Lastly, you'll find the settings submenu. This controls how the device analyzes our main input. With pitch accuracy, we can set how well the device represents the pitch information present in our main input. There are three options, good, better, and best. The device's latency depends on what you choose, with each option setting either 1024, 2048, or 4096 samples of latency, respectively. 
Next, we have time accuracy. The higher this setting, the better the device represents short-time audio events, such as transients, at the expense of CPU. Lower values may affect the LFO's ability to sample onsets. With the detection frequency, we can define the highest frequency analyzed and resynthesized from our main input. Similarly, the reinforce frequency defines up to what frequency will be reinforced in our output. Typically, low end is what requires reinforcement the most, hence its default value. But using a higher value with maximum reinforcement and a maximum detection frequency can create a sparkly, glistening effect in the high end. Like the Sepstral Morph, the Tambor Resynth also features a utilities window. Here, we can control the device's CPU usage. Watch the video which specifically covers the utilities window to learn more. It's worth noting that all of these parameters display little hints when you hover over them, and include further explanations in the InfoView tab on the left. And that covers it. I hope you find new and interesting ways to create using this tool. Consider supporting me through your purchase of these Macs for Live devices. Be sure to like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.